Welcome to Searching the Scriptures. Our Bible teacher will be Gunther von Haringa Sr. So without further ado, let's look into God's Word, the Bible. Good afternoon and welcome to BMI's Sunday Online Fellowship. Shall we begin with a word of prayer? Father in heaven, we again are so grateful to you that you have given us uh, another day. You have uh, told us that your mercies are new every morning and that your faithfulness reaches unto the clouds. And we thank you for that. Uh, we know that you alone are faithful. And uh, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to be able to sing these songs, to be able to study your word, to answer possibly some questions, uh, Father, related to the scriptures. And above all, that we can spend this day as you have instructed us to, to put aside the things that normally occupy our time and to focus upon your word and upon our relationship with you. Because after all, this day is designed uh, for our fellowship individually with you uh, and with uh, the Godhead. And we thank you for this because you know this is what we need. Uh, desperately, this is what we need as we begin this new work we, uh, or this new week. We want our focus to be altogether upon your word. And again, we thank you for the work and faith of your son. And we thank you for the scriptures above all, uh, because it is through the patience and comfort of the scriptures that indeed we have a great hope, a great hope that you will finish this short work that you have set out to do and that you will bring it to pass according to your divine wisdom and timing. And so we ask for your blessing upon our time together. We pray for the needs of those that are listening, uh, wherever they might be, uh, could it be that you would meet those needs according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus? We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first hymn is going to be Go Tell It on the Mountain. Thank you. 
Our next hymn is going to be From Heaven Above to Earth I Come. Our next hymn is going to be Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. This is going to be 2 Peter part 35, and today's date is August 13th, 2017. Let's uh, again have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that we uh, have this privilege of being able to look at 2 Peter, and we pray that as we do so, you would lead us into truth, and I pray that whatever might be said would be in accordance with your word, that you would correct anything that is not. And again, we thank you so much 
uh, Father, that you have indeed opened our eyes to many, many truths uh, through uh, the scriptures uh, over the past 28 years or so, and we trust that you will continue to do so uh, in accordance with your holy will. And so we ask for your blessing upon this time and upon each one listening. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll go ahead and read uh, verses 16 through 21 of 2 Peter 1. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were I witnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. In our examination of 2 Peter 1, we have arrived at the end of verse 20, in which we find that verses 19 to 21 are really concerned with the nature of the Bible itself. It is the living Word of God that God uses to illuminate His elect, who are by nature ignorant of God's thoughts and ways unless God in his pity and mercy opens our understanding to the spiritual realities that he has hidden in the scriptures. And I think Isaiah 55, eight through nine is an excellent uh, passage to explain why God has to lead us into his truth by his will and always according to his perfect timing, which serves his own divine purposes. And we don't know what those purposes are uh, completely as he sees the very big picture, as he sees the scope of all time, eternity past, the present, and of course, eternity future. But we know that everything he does is going to be perfect. And we can rest in that. And we can also rest in the fact that his timing likewise is perfect. And above all, we know that he's going to glorify himself. He's going to glorify the Godhead continually. We read in Isaiah 55, eight through nine, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith Jehovah. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We can also go to Luke 24, which is the chapter in which the two men are on the road to Emmaus uh, after the resurrection of Christ. And in uh, verses 27 and 44 to 45, we find some very uh, interesting and pointed verses that acknowledge the necessity for Christ to intervene personally in order for each of his elect people to comprehend the spiritual implications that he desires us to know, and more importantly, to obey. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, 
he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And you can imagine what kind of a Bible study that must have been that day as they were walking and as he was sharing all the places in the Old Testament that pointed to him, or at least many. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And we want to bear in mind that when it speaks about the law of Moses, or as it says here, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms, and sometimes we find two of these, we find the law and the prophets. Here we find all three, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. It has to do with the Old Testament. Now, the reason why it's incumbent upon God to open our understanding is really well illustrated in verse 34 of Luke 18, 31 to 34. And in this passage, we find that God utilizes three very distinct terms. Uh, understood none of these things, this saying was hid from them, and neither knew they the things that were spoken. And he uses these three different terms to underscore the apostles' inability to grasp what Christ was plainly teaching them regarding his death, burial, and resurrection. And so this really underscores how <clears throat> excuse me, crucial it is for God to open his people's understanding of even the most elementary doctrines. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated and spit it on, and they shall scourge him and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. And they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. Each child of God must humbly acknowledge this and prayerfully beseech God for his mercy whenever we approach God's word. Even though God has been exceedingly gracious, particularly to the saints of our generation, by unsealing <clears throat> the sealed book, the Bible, as we read in Revelation 5, 1 to 5, and I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, and to loose the seven seals thereof. You will recall that the book was previously sealed by the same one who opened it, as God instructed Daniel, who represents the Lord Jesus Christ, in Daniel 12, 4, 
and verses 9 through 10. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Well, in light of that, let's consider this phrase that uh, where we left off last Sunday, which is until the day dawn. Uh, here uh, in uh, verse 19. Uh, Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Uh, this word uh, dawn is uh, Strong's number 1306, and it's only used here. And it's a compound term. It's made up of the Greek uh, proposition uh, dia, uh, Strong's number 1223. And dia is commonly translated as by or through, uh, because it's a preposition. And then the second part of the compound word is Strong's number 825, algazo, which only appears once as should shine in verse 4 of 2 Corinthians 4, 1 to 7. We read there, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid, hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, and this is God himself, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine. That's our word, 826, unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And those earthen vessels uh, symbolize our weak, frail human bodies in which God has deposited the Holy Spirit. And not only did the Holy Spirit regenerate the believer's soul, but he continues to work to will and to do of his good pleasure in that soul for as long as the believer is alive on earth. And then, of course, we go to be with the Lord in heaven. So we can understand that until the day dawn is a reference to waiting upon the Lord for salvation during the day of salvation. And it's actually comparable to the next expression that we find in this verse, and the day star arise, which we can take a look at now. Uh, this phrase, and the day star arise, uh, consists of three terms, the two major words being the day star and arise. Uh, the day star is Strong's number 54, 
59. And it's practically ident identical to our English word phosphorus. Uh, it's, it's, I think, spelt the same way, except there might be a U that's missing on the end. Uh, the word for arise is anatello, uh, th Strong's number 393. Now, we don't want to uh, downplay the Greek conjunction and because it's really linking the two parallel an analogies, the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. And, and it relates to the sunrise or the sun and we have learned that the sun is actually uh, a picture or a representation of God himself. Uh, we can look at a few passages that show this. Psalm 84, 11 affirms, For Jehovah God is a sun, and this is Strong's number 81, 21, and shield. Jehovah will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Also, if we go to Malachi 4.2, here this is also translated, shall the sun, S-U-N, and again, Strong's number 8121, but unto you that fear my name shall the sun of righteousness arise with healing in his wings and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. So here we have a double picture of Christ. Not only is he the son, he's called the son of righteousness. He's also righteousness itself. Uh, and it is his righteousness that he bequeathed or gave to all of those elect during the day of salvation. We also see the physical sun in view in Psalm 19, 4 to 6, and it's compared to a bridegroom as well as a strong man to run a race. Uh, these metaphors, both of these apply to Christ, even though the strong man, at least in the New Testament, usually exemplifies Satan. Their line is gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. And that actually reminds us of the Word of God itself, as we read in Hebrews uh, 4.12 and 13, where nothing is hid from the Word of God, or we can think about the uh, penetrating gaze uh, of the Lord Jesus in the book of Revelation, where he sees everything that has ever happened, uh, and that is all completely known to him and uh, completely accessible to him. Uh, now, by the way, I should mention that this is why the darkening of the sun or the moon turning to blood, uh, symbolizing God and the Word of God, respectively, is so horrific because it signaled that mankind had entered into the day of judgment in which salvation was no longer possible as all of God's elect were saved by May 21, 2011. Uh, we read uh, in the New Testament in Mark 13, 24, but in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. Here the word the sun is Strong's number 2246, Helios. And the word for the moon is a Selene, 4582. Uh, likewise, if we go to the Old Testament, for example, uh, verse 10 
of Joel 2, 1 to 11, uh, we read there, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of Jehovah cometh, for it is nigh at hand, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pained, all faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall march every one on his, own, on his ways. And they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. And the stars shall withdraw their shining. And Jehovah shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of Jehovah is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Again, the word for the sun, Strong's 8121, and the moon, 3394 in verse 10. Now, since both the day star and arise are only found together in this one verse, we'll have to consider them individually. The day star, as I said, is phosphorus uh, 5459. And only it appears only here in 2 Peter 1.19. And it's another compound word uh, comprised of the terms uh, phos, which is 5457, and Pharaoh, or the pH, which is 5342. Uh, Foss, 5457, is predominantly rendered as light, actually 68 times, and twice as fire. On the other hand, Pharaoh, 5342, is mostly translated as bring, or bear. In other words, the one who brings the light, or we could say is the light bearer. And of course, that is the Lord Jesus Christ in the first instance, and secondly, his elect people. We'll take a look at a few illustrations of how God utilizes this first word of Foss, 5457. Verses 16 to 18 of 2 Peter 1, as we've talked about at length, are set against the backdrop of the Mount of Transfiguration. And this is recorded in Matthew 17, 2, in which this term, phos, is translated as the light, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. The light is Foss 5457. 
Now, earlier I quoted from 2 Corinthians 4, 4, when we were discussing the other compound word, dawn. And in verse 6 of 2 Corinthians 4, we discover again this word, um, phos, 54, 57, and it's uh, rendered as the light. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And again, we understand that this took place uh, during the day of salvation. Also, if we go to Acts 26, 23, uh, there it's also translated as light, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And that's actually a very important verse because of the fact that it, it mentions that he's the first that should rise from the dead. And it has to be speaking about from the foundation of the world because, because there were other people who were raised from the dead before him in the Old Testament. But he is the firstborn from the dead or the first begotten of the dead as we read in other places, but the firstborn from the dead according to Colossians 1.18. Now, one of the chapters in which uh, this word phos or light uh, occurs frequently is John chapter 1. And in verses 4 to 5, and 7 through 9, we find this term uh, quite, quite uh, re repeated quite a bit. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Uh, verse 7, the same came for a witness, speaking of John the Baptist, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The uh, following uh, exemplifies some of the ways that God utilizes the, this next word, uh, the second part of um, uh, the word phosphorus, a pharaoh, which is Strong's number 5342. And as I mentioned, it's predominantly rendered as bring or bear. And what's, what's interesting about this is that I found it in connection with uh, two uh, significant passages uh, that deal with the early or Pentecostal reign as well as the latter reign of our day. Uh, regarding the, the Pentecostal reign, if we go to verse 2 of Acts 2, 1 to 4, we find this very vivid description in which this word is rendered as of a rushing. Uh, again, regarding what transpired on the day of Pentecost, and we know that's May 22nd, 33 AD, when God initiated the time and season of the church age, which was to last 1955 years. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. This is the 120 up in the upper room. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. 
Then if we go to verses 10 and 18 of John 21, uh, 4 through 18, uh, this word is translated as bring and carry, respectively, in which the great catch of fish, which took place outside of the churches and denominations during the last 17 years of the Great Tribulation, and in Revelation 7, 9, this is referred to as the great multitude which no man could number. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, and this would be Lazarus, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish, and this is our word, 5342, bring, which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, an hundred and fifty and three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus, that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus saith unto to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved, because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. And this word carry, again, is uh, our word 5342. So we understand that Christ is both the day as well as the day star. And you might recall that he's also called the bright and morning star in Revelation 2.16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you of these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Now let's consider a few places before we close of how 
God uh, employs the term heart or soul. And this word heart is actually the same word or very similar to our word cardiac, but it's with a K and it's cardia without the C and with a K. 2588 is the Strong's number. And once again, we keep seeing 2 Corinthians 4 crop up. And sure enough, in verse 6, uh, we see this word that is rendered hearts. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts, in our cardia, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Also, if we go to Galatians 4, 6, we find this affirmation there. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And uh, lastly, Ephesians 4, 18 uh, underscores the necessity for God to provide salvation through the work and faith of the Lord Jesus during the day of salvation, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. I think we'll stop here today and then, Lord willing, uh, pick this up next Sunday. So why don't we take a 15-minute break, and then if there are any questions, we can uh, go over those, uh, Lord willing, when we come back.
We're back and we can uh, take some questions, uh, Lord willing, if anybody has any. There is one, and I'll go ahead and read that. Let's see. Um, what is your knowledge of Zechariah 14, especially verses 6 through 9 and 12 to 21, if you can expound on them? And actually, I haven't worked on this. It is quite complicated, but I'll go ahead and read the chapter. Behold, the day of Jehovah cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished. And half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall Jehovah go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley. And half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains. For the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Yea, ye shall flee like as he fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And Jehovah my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to Jehovah, not day nor night. But it shall come to pass that at evening, evening time it shall be light. And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea. In summer and in winter shall it be. And Jehovah shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord, one Jehovah, and his name one. All the land shall be turned as a plain from Geba to Rimmon, south of Jerusalem, and it shall be lifted up and inhabited in her place. From Benjamin's gate unto the, the place of the first gate, unto the corner gate, and from the tower of Hananiel unto the king's wine presses. And men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction. But Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. And this shall be the plague wherewith Jehovah will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from Jehovah shall be among them. And they shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbor. And his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor. And Judah also shall fight at Jerusalem. And the wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together, gold and silver and apparel in great abundance. And so shall be the plague of the horse, of the mule, of the camel, and of the ass, and of all the beasts that shall be in these tents as this plague. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, Jehovah of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up 
of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, Jehovah of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that have no rain, there shall be the plague, wherewith Jehovah will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. In that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto Jehovah, and the pots in Jehovah's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto Jehovah of hosts. And all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and seethe therein. And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of Jehovah of hosts. What I'll try to do is to take a look at that, at this passage this week and hopefully uh, be able to come up at least with some information by, by the time uh, Sunday rolls around. And if anyone has a question, feel free to post that. Uh, if not, we'll go ahead and go to our last three hymns. All right, let's then go to uh, hymn number four, which is Company Faithful, Raise the Strain. The next hymn is Far and Near the Fields Are Teeming.
Our last hymn is going to be From Every Stormy Wind That Blows. shall we close in prayer father again we are so thankful that you have uh, allowed us this time together and we pray for your people around the world wherever they might be that you would strengthen and encourage them uh, at the beginning of this week and that your perfect will might be accomplished in each of our lives and we thank you for your great mercies and your great faithfulness on our behalf and we pray that you would strengthen uh, your people and that you would encourage them by your word, uh, Father, because we know that it is by your encouragement and by the patience and comfort of the scriptures that we do have hope and uh, purpose to persevere during this very difficult time uh, known as the day of judgment. And we just pray for your will to be accomplished and whatever it takes for that to happen. And we just thank you that we can be a part of your kingdom, though we realize we certainly uh, don't deserve the least of your mercies or any of the truth that you have shown us. We ask these things with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for Searching the Scriptures. Until next time, to God be the glory.